So um, yes, uh, thank you, Roni, for, for inviting me. And uh, I'm going to talk about um, adaptive optics tomography for astronomy. So before I even come to the, the meat of the talk, which is, which is tomography, I have to introduce quite a few different uh, topics before that. So uh, astronomical adaptive optics, I'll spend a, a few minutes describing what it is. Uh, then I will shortly describe wavefront sensing and atmospheric turbulence. Then I'll talk about laser guide stars. And then finally, uh, I will try to say a few words about uh, tomography in AO. Uh, I'll describe a few key ideas, limitations, and difficulties. And then uh, perhaps uh, a few ideas for the future developments. And uh, at the end, I'll, I'll give um, a, a full page of uh, uh, references where you can learn more and where you can get, uh, I think, uh, more equations than I will have on my slides. So um, the, to, to, to say the context today, uh, the uh, uh, European Sovereign Observatory, where I work, has a uh, four eight meter telescope in Chile, in Paranal, and um, these are so eight meter telescopes. And on one of the telescopes, this one, this is called Unit Telescope 4, UT4, um, has four laser guide stars. And those four laser guide stars allow to have one tomographic operational AO system, so adaptive optic system. Um, and we have many other adaptive optic systems without tomography. So tomography is, let's say, the the next development uh, in, in the field of adaptive optics. And uh, right now we are developing the next generation for, for, for this DLT uh, telescope of uh, the next uh, tom tomography AO system. So this is, I would say today because the telescopes exist. Uh, so this is reality. And the dream is this. So tomorrow, uh, well, in, in, a, in a couple of years, we, uh, we will inaugurate the next generation of telescopes, the 39 meter extremely large telescope. And that one will have uh, six laser guide stars and the first uh, three light, the three first light instruments all will use AO and two of them will use tomography. And uh, I think the first light is planned somewhere in, in, in a few years. Uh, plus uh, some uh, COVID uh, convolution probably. But uh, uh, let's say that this telescope is already being built. We have a mountain, we have made, uh, uh, we have poured a lot of concrete already in the mountain to, to, to build this telescope. So, so, so it's, it, it will be reality in a, in a few years. So what is adaptive optics uh, for astronomy and why do we need it? Um, I'm not going to spend a, a huge amount of time on, on this, but, but I think these two images uh, show the potential of, of, of the, the technology. So what you see here is a stellar field observed with ISAC. So it's an instrument without adaptive optics on, on the DLT. And you see that uh, each of these uh, dark spots is a star. And astronomers want to measure properties of these stars um, using the, the highest resolution that you, that you can. And the problem is that the Earth's atmosphere severely limits uh, the resolution that you can get from uh, a large telescope. So here you see the, uh, the blobs that are the stars. And, and what you can, what you can see, say is that the, the image quality of full width half max of each of these stars um, of a very large telescope, so like eight to, to 39 meter, telemeter, uh, meter diameter is limited to that of a 20 centimeter telescope. So the loss in resolution due to atmospheric turbulence is tremendous. Um, and the purpose of adaptive optics is to go from this to this. So you see that the stars have become, thanks to adaptive optics, this is a, an early uh, tomographic AO system, a demonstrator, um, that the, the, the stars have shrunk tremendously and the resolution that you obtain with adaptive optics 
is much, much higher than without adaptive optics. And the next step is uh, to, to use this uh, 39 meter telescope. So here uh, is a simulation of that, uh, uh, of an image that we will be able to obtain with tomographic AO on a 39 meter telescope of the same field. And you see that thanks to adaptive optics, you can really take advantage of the resolution uh, that the 39 meter telescope will provide. Um, Whereas without adaptive optics, you would pretty much get the same image as, as, as the one seen here um, with only more photons, of course. You would still gather more photons, but the resolution, you would be limited by the atmosphere. So one other thing that we have to say is that the atmosphere varies fast. The time scale is a few milliseconds. So whatever we, we do, we need to do fast. And there are two solutions uh, to this problem of increasing the resolution of, of uh, ground-based telescope is to send them to space. So there are quite a lot of constraints uh, for this solution. And this is an example. This is the next generation space telescope, the JWST, um, or use adaptive optics. And that's pretty much it. So that's why the next generation of, of ground-based telescope will be so heavily adaptive optics oriented. So what is this adaptive optics uh, I'm talking about? Um, so you have light coming from the telescope uh, that has a, a distorted wavefront. And this distorted wavefront uh, has been made by atmospheric turbulence. To correct this, uh, this distorted wavefront, we have a deformable mirror. So it really is a mirror which has little motors behind it to, to change the shape. Of, um, of this mirror in real time, so at the millisecond time scale. And once uh, the distorted wavefront goes through or goes is reflected by this deformable mirror, in principle, we have uh, regained the resolution uh, that we have lost due to, to, the, um, uh, to the atmosphere. So how do we know how to uh, actuate these, these little uh, actuators on the DM? Well, we take part of the light coming from, from a star and we send it to a wavefront sensor, which analyzes how uh, the light has been distorted by the atmosphere. And then these measurements are sent to a control system, so basically a computer that calculates commands to be sent to the deformable mirror. And as you see in this uh, schematic, we actually don't look directly at uh, the turbulence, but we look at the residual uh, of what we have not corrected at the previous time step. So this is a closed loop system where at the beginning, the DM is flat. Uh, we see the full turbulence, we actuate, uh, then we improve, we see the residual. So what we got wrong, again, we improve and so on. And we iterate in this uh, closed loop system uh, to, to get the best performance. And we try to go as fast as possible because of course the, the uh, atmosphere is, is distorting, uh, it, the atmosphere is changing. And then part of the light, uh, usually a, another wavelength, is sent to the science camera uh, that uh, will make the astronomical observations. So uh, this wavefront sensor here, this box, uh, usually in the, in the tomographic AO system is a Shack hartman system. And it, it uh, dissects the pupil into small little subapertures, and in each subaperture, it measures the derivative of the phase. So the phase needs to be reconstructed in some way from these uh, local gradients into uh, a, a global shape. We also need uh, a reference star, and I put star in, in brackets. It can be either an actual star or a laser that uh, I, I will discuss later to get uh, the signal from the atmospheric distortion. So we need to, th this is what allows us to say how the atmosphere has distorted uh, the wavefront coming from, from the stars. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, the wavefront sensor doesn't actually see turbulence. It sees whatever the adaptive optics didn't correct at the previous loop cycle. So it sees the residuals. Okay. So at the beginning, what you see is a very short uh, image, short integration time images of, of a blob, which is without adaptive optics correction, what the star would, would look like. And you see that it really is a blob. 
And now we have switched on the adaptive optic system. And you can see that instead of a blob, we actually have a double star. Um, so you can see how at first, uh, the AO system hasn't converged it and the deformable mirror doesn't have uh, the right shape. And after a few iterations, uh, we have been able to close the loop and uh, we have been able to correct uh, this, uh, the atmospheric turbulence in real time. Uh, this is not yet a tomographic AO system, but you can see how, um, how uh, the, the AO system really uh, improves the ima image quality dramatically once it's switched on. So uh, we think we know quite well uh, atmospheric turbulence. Uh, there's quite a lot of models on uh, how uh, to describe it. Uh, so we know that the turbulence gets easier. Uh, this is the, the coherence length. It gets easier to correct the atmospheric turbulence in the, in the near infrared compared to the visible. The coherence length in the, in the near infrared is larger. Uh, we also know that um, if you want to correct in another direction than uh, where you are measuring the uh, atmospheric turbulence, the angular decorrelation uh, is much easier to, to correct in, in the near infrared. And there are formulae that uh, tell you how to calculate this uh, isoplanetic angle, which is the, uh, the, the angular, which describes the angular decorrelation of turbulence uh, uh, as a function of uh, at what height the turbulence is located at. And I'll talk about this later. Uh, we also know that uh, in the near infrared, the temporal evolution of the, uh, of the atmosphere is slower. And so um, uh, this is why most of the adaptive optic systems for the moment work uh, in the near infrared instead of, uh, instead of the visible. It's because the turbulence is more easy to correct uh, at those wavelengths. So, uh, how do we measure the, the turbulent distortions? And, and this is the, the Shack Hartman sensor, which is, uh, I would say, the most used in tomographic AO systems. Uh, I'm sure someone will find an exception, but uh, this is the, 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 the most used ones. Um, so as I said, we, we cut the telescope pupil with uh, small lenslets into small squares. And over each of these squares, we, we measure the, we, we make an image of this lenslet array on a fast uh, detector. And uh, when the wavefront that comes in is not a plane wavefront, but it's distorted by turbulence, the position of the images uh, made by the subapertures moves around. As you can see, for example, on this one, um, the spot that is made by uh, this lenslet has moved compared to its reference position, which tells us that there is a tilt over this subaperture. And so uh, this tilt tells us something about the gradient of the, of the wavefront. So uh, what we get uh, as a measurement is a collection of small gradients over the pupil that at some point we have to basically integrate into uh, the full wavefront over the telescope uh, aperture. Um, as I've shown before, um, light propagates um, fr from, from natural stars, light propagates through a cylinder. So he here I've represented turbulence layers and here is the, the aperture of the telescope and the light that comes from infinity, basically the the, the astronomical objects propagates uh, as a cylinder in uh, above your telescope. So this is the the the, the white uh, areas are the so, so the the white circles here uh, the, the white um, uh, ovals here are the area that we are trying to measure and we are trying to correct the integral over this uh, cylinder uh, of the turbulence. So. And now the problem is to measure this cylinder, we, um, we need a star. And unfortunately, there are not that many stars in, this, in the sky that are bright enough to do this analysis. 
And so uh, what uh, people have found out is that actually what you can do is that instead of relying on these uh, uh, stars, what you can do is that you can use a laser. So here is a, a, a very schematic representation of the uh, measurements that you get with a, a laser guide star. Uh, so the, the, the laser guide star is a, a laser beam propagated to an altitude of about 90 kilometers. And this laser guide stars probes the turbulence up to 90 kilometers. And we are lucky because atmospheric turbulence stops around 20 kilometers. There's no air anymore. So, so we don't need to, to, go, to go very high. However, what you can see here is that the, because of uh, the finite altitude of the laser guide star, about 90 kilometers, um, the light that comes back from the laser guide star actually comes uh, is seen by a, as a cone. So we are not probing all of the turbulence that we would like to probe. You see that here there are these, these areas outside of the cone, so between the, between the cylinder and the cone, that are not probed at all by this single laser guide star. So uh, for very large telescopes, um, using a single laser guide star uh, doesn't bring you uh, all the performance that we, that we, that we would like because uh, we are missing pieces. We are missing all these pieces here of turbulence that, uh, that uh, we cannot see. So what to do? Ha! Of course, uh, what we can do is that we cannot use just one laser guide star, but several. So if you put several laser guide stars, you see that now you are um, much better covering this, uh, this cylinder. Uh, and uh, the, the areas where you don't have any measurement of the turbulence have almost vanished. You are maybe a bit out of luck here for the higher turbulence layers, but usually there's not much turbulence there. So, so it, it, it works. So um, now th th this gives uh, pretty much the, the key ideas for the tomography. Tomography is putting these multiple measurements together in order to uh, reconstruct turbulent layers, not only at the pupil of the telescope, but in altitude. And then uh, putting several deformable mirrors. Here, uh, I put two. This one is, uh, you can imagine it's a deformable mirror, and this one too. Um, so you have measured the, the, the full, uh, the full uh, cylinder. And you can also measure and correct outside of the cylinder, which means that you are going to increase the corrected field of view. So I, I will talk about this a bit later. But um, in addition of building a, a volume of, uh, of turbulence to correct in the direction of the, of the central star without missing pieces, now you can also increase the field of view. So you can go outside of the, of the cylinder and start to correct these pieces here which will allow to see a wider field uh, improved by the, the adaptive optics. So what, what I want to, to, to stress here is that, so, so you have multiple lasers to probe the whole volume, not, not just um, the cone or not just a cylinder, but a, 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 a larger area, which is called a metapupil. Tomography is here to put these measurements together to reconstruct layers at different altitudes, and then using multiple deformable mirrors in a scheme called multi-conjugate adaptive optics, you can, once, once you know uh, the, the turbulent layers, you can project them onto the deformable mirrors and correct multiple deformable with multiple deformable mirrors uh, the measurements that you got from multiple guide stars. It sounds complicated and it's, it's, it's not that simple, but it works. So here is an example of a system that actually works on the sky. Uh, it actually even worked uh, last night, um, where you have four laser guide stars, and these are all pointed at the same object. And here we do uh, a particular case of, of tomography where we don't want to increase the field of view. We have four lasers just to correct for the cone effect, but we do not increase the field of view. So we only have one deformable mirror. This is called laser tomography AO or LTAO. 
but uh, you can see that this is not just a project of uh, of uh, r d this is actually something that works uh, every day or every night um, at the observatory in Paraná. so uh, now how do we do this in practice from the from the actual tomography point of view so the classic way which is uh, uh, quite old and well quite uh, yeah quite old um, is to build what we call an interaction matrix. So this is a, a generalization of what we did before, uh, multiple lasers, multiple deformable mirrors, where we had just one deformable mirror, one wavefront sensor. We looked at the star, we poked um, at uh, an individual actuator, and we looked at the uh, response on the wavefront sensor. We did this for all the actuators. And we built an interaction matrix like this. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, come back to that in the previous in the next slide. So the interaction matrix M is actually the forward model, and uh, in the the case we, I am going to talk about, it is synthetic, so you don't actually need to measure it. You just need to to to, to calculate it in the computer. Once you have this interaction matrix, which um, basically uh, describes the relationship between your measurements your uh, model uh, M and the commands, once you get this interaction matrix, you simply invert it with a truncated SVD. And usually you need some filtering because there are some things that we actually don't measure from the wavefront sensor and from the laser guide stars. And what we do once this is inverted is that we say, <clears throat> simply take the measurement vector B, we multiply it by this uh, command matrix and we get the commands. And that's it. So you have a synthetic model of the system that you invert, the forward model that you invert uh, very primitively. And then you just uh, do a matrix vector multiply and uh, you get a command. And then because we need to uh, have um, a temporal evolution, we uh, uh, put a bit of temporal filtering. So usually a classical integrator with a gain G. And you see uh, here the, the simple solution to the problem. Uh, the commands at iteration n are the previous commands plus the gain times the new commands that we obtained uh, with um, this uh, command matrix multiplication. And that's it. So this is a quite a, a general uh, process. So how do we uh, do this uh, interaction matrix in tomography? And uh, I was really happy to find these slides, which I uh, already uh, made for my PhD thesis many moons ago. So um, this, this shows you how, how classic this way is. And of course, uh, as, as, as adaptive optics uh, slide should be there in French, but I think the, the ideas are pretty clear. So you have your uh, laser guide star, you have your deformable mirror conjugate to some, some altitude, you have your telescope with your Shack Hartman sensor, you push uh, an influence function. So this is something that represent, represents how uh, your deformable mirror deforms when you poke just one actuator. So you, you poke the actuator, actuator and you model how this poke is um, uh, propagated through the laser guide star. So you can see that the, the influence function is zoomed because of the laser guide star altitude at 90 kilometers. It shifted from the position here because, uh, the because of the position of the laser guide star. And then what you do here, you will calculate the response, the, the measurement of the wavefront sensor to this unitary poke. Uh, and uh, you will store it as a, a column of the, of the interaction matrix. And uh, you will do this for all the actuators of the deformable mirrors for all the laser guide stars. And you will get a big matrix that will take into account the position and number of the laser guide stars, the cone effect, the wavefront sensor model, the altitude and number of the TMs and so on. So this will be your generalized interaction matrix, uh, which uh, you will then uh, be able to uh, invert. So, Conceptually, uh, the tomographic algorithms are usually multi-step. You need to somehow uh, go from the gradients to the wavefront in one direction, but you have to be careful because uh, maybe you need to take into account some correlation between the wavefront sensors. 
uh, you need to reconstruct some meta wavefront at some discrete layers. So basically in order to decone the measurements of the lasers uh, first, and then you need to switch the pieces together to get uh, the measurement from two. So you need to switch, stitch together the measurement from the different directions. Usually you select some optimization directions. So basically this means cylinders in some given number of directions. And then you have a projection operation that minimizes the residual wavefronts on the average of the optimization directions. And usually you will need some priors because um, the problem will be ill conditions. So usual, the usual suspects will be the power spectrum of the open loop turbulence and some noise covariance matrix of the Shack-Hartman measurements. Uh, one uh, big family of methods that have been proposed and uh, at least in simulation works quite well, uh, iterative solution based on uh, some minimum mean square uh, error uh, criterion minimization. Here is the relatively general uh, expression for what you want to do. So you have a wavefront sensor model S, you have uh, W, which is the wavefront D, you have the data, and then you have two kinds of uh, covariance matrices and the noise covariance matrix here and the turbulence covariance matrix here. Uh, so probably you, let's, let's talk about it later, but one solution is to solve this iteratively because uh, if you have large telescopes, the matrices that you would have to handle are very large. Um, CG is, is efficient here. Uh, some bits and pieces of the matrix are sparse, so uh, it can save you quite a lot of time. And in closed loop, you can start very close to the solution. So uh, another benefit is that um, because you don't have a big matrix, but equations, if the system changes, you can very quickly change your forward model because you just need to change equations and not a huge matrix. So that, that could be a pro. However, uh, some pieces are not sparse. So some clever tricks might be necessary to, to sparsify things. Um, and the number of iterations here can be high. So um, you need to be clever about preconditioners. Um, and there has been a whole uh, families of uh, preconditioners that have been explored and also uh, basis functions that have been explored uh, for this problem. Um, there has been quite a lot of discussions about, well, should we actually calculate the matrix or should we go towards iterative methods? And they both have pros and cons. Um, historically, adaptive optics has always worked with the matrix vector multiply. So uh, because um, there is a lot of conservatism in the field in engineering, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Uh, a lot of people tend to think, well, let's continue using matrices. Um, it's convenient to, because you can easily tweak the algorithm. You just need to multiply the matrix by something and, and off you go. Uh, you can easily uh, filter things. However, it's computationally very costly uh, because once you start tinkering with the matrix, it generally doesn't stay sparse if it even was at the beginning. Um, However, from the real-time computer point of view, it's relatively easy to pipeline. So you don't need all the measurements to be ready at once. You can already read your detector and at the same time start calculating your command. So there are some benefits. Um, and also the MVM is very parallelizable, which is not always true for iterative methods, which have quite a lot of serial components in them. Uh, however, the most of the research right now is in the iterative algorithms. Uh, because I, I guess because they are new and uh, you can reduce the computational load by a lot. Uh, and uh, some of the smart, some of the matrices are quite sparse. So, so it, you, you can have a very, very, very big gain in, in uh, using these iterative methods. So just as an example of how tomography works, actually, uh, this is a numerical simulation of uh, uh, of uh, a, a multi-conjugate adaptive optic system on the ELT. So here is without adaptive optics, you just see uh, very fuzzy blobs. Uh, you, put, you put on the, the regular adaptive optics, so you don't do tomography, you just correct in one direction towards the, the center. So you see that towards the center, um, your, um, 
your performance is good, but as soon as you go in the field, you, you see a degradation of, of the performance because you are only correct in one direction and the atmosphere is not the same in this direction and in this direction. So you get fuzzy images in the corners. And then when you, oops, when you put the uh, MCAO, uh, multi-conjugate adaptive optics with tomography, you get a fully corrected field of view with sharp stars at the center and also at the edges. And if you um, just uh, uh, flick between um, uh, these two images, you, you can see that uh, there is a dra dramatic difference between, between the two, So which, which tells you why we want these tomographic AO systems. So now, now I'm I, I I I'm going into the the, the difficulties. So uh, the wavefront sensors only measure the gradients, so you need some sort of wavefront reconstruction. Quite a few algorithms exist for this. It's an active field of research. Um, the laser guide stars themselves they have a few peculiarities. They don't measure the tip tilt, so which is basically the global image motion. So the laser goes up and it comes back down the same way as it did. So the image doesn't move. Um, the image of the laser guide star doesn't move as uh, a real star would. As you, see in the, as you saw in the previous videos, you, you saw a global movement of the image. And this is not measured by the lasers because it doesn't follow exactly the same path as, as the natural guide star does. The natural guide star just goes down, whereas the laser goes up and then it goes down. Uh, then the sodium layer, uh, which we use to, to create the laser guide star is thick. So um, this, uh, I, I have a slide uh, later, which shows that it makes um, the spots on the Jacques Hartmann wavefront sensor, uh, it makes them uh, unhomogeneous. So some of them are elongated, which means that the noise is not the same on, on all of the sub apertures. And so this needs to be taken into account. This is the so-called spot elongation. And then uh, again, because the sodium layer is thick, some measurements are biased and, and need some sort of filtering because not only uh, is there a different noise in some of the subapertures, but the, there might be a bias also. So this shows you the atmospheric vertical uh, structure of the turbulence. So uh, I, I said in the, in the previous, uh, uh, slides that uh, in tomography you want to reconstruct a few layers. Well, there you are. Here you have a few layers, and actually, when you when you do high resolution measurement, you see that you have thousands of layers. So one of the questions is, well, which one should you reconstruct? And of course, these these layers change as a function of time. So then uh, you have questions about, well, how often do you need to change the forward model? How often do you need to add or change the layers that you're reconstructing? It, it, it's not a, a, an easy problem. Um, also, um, we have only a limited number of laser guide stars because they are frankly quite expensive. Um, and so we can have four, maybe six, um, but that's it. Uh, the flux coming back from the lasers is not uh, a huge limitation anymore, but we shouldn't go on wasting photons. So the algorithms need to be clever and need to be taken in, taking into account the noise properties of the measurements. Uh, and as I said, the spot elongation needs to be taken into account. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, luckily, the corrected field of view that we want is, is, is uh, limited because we don't have enough pixels. So uh, we don't need huge amounts of uh, corrected field for, for the tomography. Uh, and one thing which I haven't touched on much is that uh, we still, because we can't measure the tip tilt, uh, we still need natural guide stars, which are not that many uh, and they are faint. So we only need to measure the tip tilt from them but uh, still we cannot observe the sky everywhere that we want. We, the situation is much better with lasers, but it's not perfect. So uh, here you can see the, the shape of the Jacques Hartmann spots when you project the laser from behind the secondary, so uh, from the center of the telescope. And you see that as you go further and further away from the launch telescope, uh, the spots get more and more elongated. And if, uh, uh, the telescope is really big, then these edge subapertures might even see truncation, so you cannot measure the whole spot. Um, if you have uh, the launch telescope on the side, like we will have on the ELT, uh, you see that the spots are even more elongated like this. 
um, and they are good in uh, they, they are less elongated close to the close to the launch telescope and you can see that uh, some I mean one of the directions is not elongated and the other one is very elongated so so this um, doesn't uh, make the the wavefront reconstruction any easier because you have to take it into account. So as I have said, not all the spots have the same noise. X and Y measurements are correlated. You have more noise on the allocated direction. So you need some sort of covariance matrix to be estimated. So it needs a model, which can be wrong. It needs to be updated and so on. Um, and this limits the wavefront algorithms, also, the wavefront reconstruction algorithm that can be used. Some spot, as I said, can be also truncated if you don't have enough field of view. So you have a bias. So you need big detectors, which is a hard constraint. And uh, also everything uh, changes with time because the sodium layer is changing. So um, either you calibrate it or you have you use some classic, some, um, uh, some uh, more clever uh, centroiding algorithms to measure the position of the spots, but it, it's not that easy. So uh, again, an interesting feature of the tomography is that if you have multiple lasers like you have in tomography, um, what you can do is that you can have several launch telescopes, like here we have three, um, and you can see that uh, the, the, the spots made by this laser guide star here will be not elongated here and will be very elongated here. Uh, the spots made by this will not be elongated here and will be very elongated here. And if all the turbulence was close to the ground, you could just simply replace the measurement uh, that is very elongated here by uh, a measurement of the, of the laser close to it, which is not elongated, and be done with it. Unfortunately, the turbulence is distributed in 3D, so you have to be more clever and you have to put some a priori knowledge in there so that the, the system can cleverly uh, filter out the long directions and only keep the short direction and know that uh, the good measurement on the short direction has more weight than the, the measurement at the same location, uh, but with more noise. So this is all taken into account in the noise covariance matrices, but it's complicated. Okay, uh, I, I think uh, I, I won't uh, spend so much time here on the centroiding algorithms and the, the impact on, on the wavefront reconstruction. But basically, uh, the way that you do the measurements on these elongated spots, um, you can uh, have an influence on how they are biased, how well they propagate noise. And there's quite a lot of studies to see how making the measurements and integrating them in the reconstruction process uh, improves your, your um, your reconstruction quality. So uh, we know that uh, the atmosphere is evolving at millisecond time scale. So we need fast real-time algorithms. Um, there may be other perturbations in the than the atmosphere like vibrations. So we might do, want to use something called split tomography where some of the correction is taken from the natural guide stars that we have in the field. Some are taken from the laser guide stars and then we have to somehow mix them um, and uh, then, of course, the AO system itself is not perfect. The AO system itself is evolving with time. So the forward model is evolving with time, with temperature, gravity, and so on. So you have multiple additional loops that keep the system nominal. So you, you, uh, you move the deformable mirrors or the wavefront sensors so that you are closer to your forward model. But also you can change the forward model. So uh, this is a whole new field, which is called auto-adaptive optics, which from the loop data tries to estimate how your forward model is wrong compared to your assumptions. And this is uh, a, a, an interesting and quite active uh, field of research. Now I have a movie. Uh, so let's see if I can get it to work. Um, so th this is a simulation of uh, uh, multi-conjugate adaptive optics with a sort of tip uh, split tomography, where here you don't have adaptive optics, so you see the blobs moving around. Now, if you um, if you close the adaptive optics loop, 
but uh, some of the modes, the so-called plate scale modes, which are controlled by the natural guide stars are not corrected. You see sharp stars, but you see the sharp stars moving around. So, so uh, you see that uh, there is a, some kind of breathing in the, in the position of the stars. And this is because we have closed one of the loops of the laser guide stars, but not all of the loops. Uh, we have not included the natural guide stars. And then if you take the next movie, which is, we have closed all the loops and now we understand why there is this little satellite going over is because once you have closed the loop uh, in the simulation, everything is perfectly stable. We have a beautiful reconstruction uh, and uh, the system doesn't seem to be evolving anymore because we have perfectly corrected for the atmospheric turbulence. So uh, I'm going to uh, be at the end of my talk. So I haven't talked about much uh, the temporal matters um, we have mostly talking, uh, talked about uh, spatial reconstruction, but every few milliseconds we need another reconstruction because the wavefront evolved. Usually we don't really take into account the fact that we have already corrected uh, the, the turbulence at the previous iteration. We are in closed loop, so it's kind of automatically taken into account, but um, it's, it's not the temporal and the spatial uh, reconstructions are usually not super well um, combined, they are usually dealt by uh, different people, different groups. Uh, one does spatial reconstruction, one does uh, temporal filtering. Uh, there are some tricks that you could uh, do using iterative reconstructors to take into account the fact that you have almost converged on a solution at the previous iteration. Um, usually there's uh, some business about pseudo open loop control, which, which means that we know the statistics of the open loop turbulence, we know the atmosphere, we don't know exactly uh, how the what the statistics of the residuals, which is what we observe should be, so we have to reconstruct what the AO would see if it was not in closed loop. So uh, this is uh, what the pseudo open loop control is, and it's another complexity to already a complex thing. And of course, uh, Kalman filters is what the rigorous way is to combine wavefront reconstruction and temporal priors. And there has been quite a lot of research on that. And then prediction. Uh, so predicting uh, the AO uh, performance, uh, uh, predicting what the, the turbulence will be in the, in the couple of frames is, is, is a big area, uh, of course, with some machine learning in there. So I am almost finished. Um, so wh where to next? I think every 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 area could still see some uh, some improvements. Um, the big point is that the first generation tomographic system work. The next challenge will be the giant telescope, and the, the talk the next talk by Lorenzo and Simone will will show you that. The algorithm needs uh, improvement. Uh, how do you account for real world effects, prediction? Uh, we rely more and more on, on models. Are they accurate? Uh, turbulence models, uh, temporal models, uh, sodium layer models, um, system models, all of this we don't, I mean, we, we hope they are, but uh, uh, there's quite a lot of research going on. And uh, finally, uh, I have put here a list of papers with some uh, starting points where you can uh, start to learn more about this. And I particularly recommend the latest link. It's uh, the work done by Ronnie's group on a different tomographic algorithm. I think they present quite well all the, the different algorithm that they explored uh, in the frame of a contract we had uh, with them for uh, a few years ago. And uh, thank you for your attention. I'm sorry to be a bit late. <laughs>